Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin at 4700 Grover Avenue. Our forums are free and open to the public, and you can find out more about our forums by going to our website at www.austinuu.org. Today I'm very excited and honored to be able to introduce J. David Bamberger, of the Bamberger Ranch, who's going to be speaking on habitat restoration and the quality of life. Back in 1969, he purchased uh, what the locals had dubbed the worst piece of real estate in Blanco County, which was 5,500 acres of degraded, unproductive ranch land. And he's devoted his life to restoring that land to its original healthy condition through selective clearing and planting of native trees and, and grasses. And this ranch is known as Sela. It's the largest habitat restoration project on private land in the state of Texas. Um, so he's going to tell you about this transformation and reemergence of water and springs and all of that. He has been a lifelong environmentalist who understands the interdependence of plants, wildlife, and humans. His book, Water from Stone, was published in 2007 by the Texas A&M Press. He served in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in World War II, and he has a B.S. from Kent State University and an honorary Ph.D. as well. He has served on numerous boards. I couldn't even begin to summarize all his honors and accolades, um, in including the Texas Nature Conservancy, the Private Lands Advisory Board, the Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, Division, the Travis County Audubon Society, and KLRU Public Broadcasting. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to David Bamberger. Thank you, David. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you a lot, Bonnie, for the introduction. It wasn't really necessary. I just like to come into a church like this and preach the gospel of conservation. That's, that's what I'm here for. <clears throat> and I like to look at a lot of gray hair like I'm seeing today, too. It kind of makes me feel more comfortable than with the real young. I'm usually asked, uh, and I would, I would make a bet that you people here, most of you know the word Selah. I did five years of Bible study when I was much younger. I studied the Old Testament. <clears throat> and in the Old Testament, I discovered this word, Selah, uh, 71 times. And it was at the end uh, in the, psalm, the psalmist. And because Bible scholars thought that uh, the psalmist was singing uh, the, and chanting the messages that he was given to the people, uh, they, Bible scholars, believe that the word means to stop, uh, pause, and think about all of this. And I thought to myself at the time, what a beautiful word. If I ever can own a ranch, I'm going to call it Sela. To me, Sela is like Walden was to Thoreau, a place to stop and pause and reflect on Mother Nature and think about what my duty, what my responsibility is, is to her. <clears throat> so my search for the worst piece of land in, that I could find began back in the late 60s. And it became Sela. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to show you a few images and to tell you in advance that just like uh, Andy Sanson that spoke to you a few weeks ago, the whole story, although it wasn't intended this way when I began, is actually a story of water. This piece of land that I bought has, has received a lot of honors that you will see here. And all, all of these so-called honors, are they didn't come in one year or 10 years. Uh, it took about 25 before it started to have the results that I'd like to speak on today. I'd like to get to the spot. Well, I like this one because it came with a $10,000 check. <laughs> but, 
But all of these honors are a result of working with Mother Nature and recognizing what really makes things click in the natural world. These kind of scenes exist there today, but now let me take you back 44 years. I want also to say that my life was actually influenced by two, two individuals. One, of course, was my mother, who would not let us eat anything that was manufactured. We were very poor. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water until I was four or five years old. Our mother taught my, me and my brothers how to take a colander and go out in the woods and come back with berries and leaves and uh, nuts and things that we could actually eat and cut a little bacon into it and make a delicious salad. My mother was tacking up signs long before Rachel Carson wrote the, word, the book that was credited with the beginning of the environmental movement, which was Silent Spring. Mom was going down this old county road with signs that she'd fashioned on a piece of cardboard. Do not spray. Do not spray. She gave me this book written by Lewis Bromfield. This, too, was before Rachel Carson wrote that book. And Bromfield's book, Pleasant Valley, had a big impact on my life. And I teach and instruct and deliver to children that come to the ranch today about the necessity to read and not just keep watching that screen. Here's the way this place looked. Just pictures of it, a few pictures of it, because I know we don't have enough time. If you knew me, really knew me like some of you in the audience does, you know I could stand up here for two hours. So I gotta be careful today. But you see, you see the cedar trees. This, this, this ranch was basically 100% uh, scenes like this. And that is the side of a hill that exists like that, yet today only worse, because the realtor that delivered this property for me said, you can have as much of this as you want, and I stopped halfway up that hill. But remember that picture, because there's gonna be more. Now down in the valleys, yes, there was some soil down in the valleys, uh, but so much of the cedar was in the valleys that the sunshine and the rainfall, neither one came to the surface very much. Now, I talked to you about that hill picture earlier. This is the, where I stopped buying. And the scene on the right is even worse. That was the hillside scene I showed you three slides ago. And this is the fence on the left. And let me tell you, that picture was taken 15 years ago. And so we're even more wonderful today than it showed then. Now, we talk about cedar trees and so on as being the culprit. There are many, many woody species that are almost as destructive to Mother Nature and to the water systems as the cedar. The cedar, contrary to what a lot of people seem to believe, it truly is a native tree, and it's a good tree. This one, you can see how big that uh, trunk is. We didn't take any of those out, and we don't do that today. What, we're, what we removed was second, third, and sometimes fourth growth cedar. The wonderful thing, I've always been a, f a follower and a believer that our federal government's best, best department was the old Soil Conservation Service, and I got help from them, and I asked them out, and, and I sh we demonstrated some things that we didn't know ourselves. But in that very first picture I showed you with the, uh, the caliche and the no grass and the cedars, we found that when we pushed these uh, bushy type second, third, fourth growth cedar away, even though there was absolutely no soil at the drip line, at the trunk, where the trunk hit the earth, we found nine inches of soil. But as we pushed the trees over and got out to the drip line, we found none. Our equipment that we used to do it was a, a used bulldozer that we bought for $20,000 and put 14,000 hours on it doing this, which is $2 million worth of work, and is now for sale for $20,000. It was a pretty good investment, you know. Uh, this is a practice that I don't recommend to anybody anymore, but you have to realize that there was no space for this. Everything on all of this land was just, just a forest 
that you couldn't even penetrate. You sometimes crawled on your knees, but she sure didn't drive or ride a horse through it. So we did stack and burn. But the, one of the keys, and the soil conservation people told me at the very beginning, as Bamberger, we're glad you're here doing this, but this is wrong. This is wrong, it won't work. What you're doing, they're exposing all of this, where you're taking out all of this brush, you're exposing it now to one of these 10, five and six and 10 inch rainfalls we get here in the hill country. And when it does, you're gonna lose every bit of soil you discovered, because they were amazed too about this nine inches of soil under these trees. But they didn't know that I had some ideas of my own and some things that I'd learned from reading Lewis Bromfield's book, Pleasant Valley. So what we did, we scarified the ground by using a spring tooth cultivator, which broke, we broke dozens of times and all this uh, equipment you have to wear now is so complicated you can't get your chainsaw started. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I didn't wear a helmet and I got plenty of rocks that hit me in the back of the head doing this. This is a scene I put in here on purpose because on the right you can see how we scarified the soil and on the, on the right, you're looking at it, on the left, the remains of that old brushy cedar that I told you was second, third, fourth growth. The scarifying of the soil was designed to, if we got that 10 inch rain or that seven inch, whatever it was, that we got it, it would somewhat retard the runoff of water. But the other reason for it was, was to provide a seed bed for native grasses, none of which were there. And in a minute, I'm gonna show you the value of that. But I wanna look at a picture of this, this effort 14 months later. Oh, I bargained for it. That's where I had to put the seed down. I used the wrong program this morning here. Uh, that that's spreading the seed. And I, I, do, do, I do this just for funds, but I, I went into Douglas King Seed Company in San Antonio and asked to buy some seed. I got a little half ton pickup truck. And I laid the list down that I wanted and he looked at me and said, Mr. Bamberger, what are you driving? I said, I got my pickup out there. He said, you don't understand native seed. He said, you better go home and get an 18 wheeler. <laughs> He said, native seed, you get a bag of native seed this big, but you only get this much pure live seed. He says, there's a lot of chaff and everything goes with it. It can't be helped, that's the way it's harvested. It's not raised like oats or wheat or so on. He says, you do that and come on back, and I did. He called me in two weeks, and he rounded up as much native seed as he could find. I wanted it from local as much as possible, but it didn't exist, so, but it did all come from Texas. And about, I went home. Anyway, there's the picture of the 14 months later. And I want to finish the seed story, however. About two weeks after that, I got a call from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And they were looking, I picked up the phone. I said, Bamberger Ranch said, yeah, we need 300 PLS pounds of little blue stem and about 150 PLS pounds of side oats grandma. I said, wait, wait, <laughs> uh, you got the wrong number. Uh, I'm not in the seed business. He said, oh, we, we know that, but uh, everywhere we went, they said you'd bought it all. <laughs> First time in my life I cornered the market. <laughs> it was at the same time the Hunt brothers were trying to corner the market on silver, and they, they lost millions. Okay, but just think of this. Now, when I bought this piece of land, and met the Soil Conservation Service at my front gate, which didn't exist, it was just an old barbed wire tra trap. He come out of his truck and he said, Mr. Bamberger, I'm glad to meet you. He had maps and aerial pictures all under his arms. He was really enthusiastic. He said, uh, I've been for years trying to get something to happen on here. He says, you just bought the worst piece of land in Johnson in Blanco County. And I said, that was a home run to me. But he said, you don't realize, I don't know what you're gonna do with this place. <laughs> Hope you're not gonna try to raise cattle. He said, it'll take 41 acres to support one cow here. I've been a fellow traveler of all of the conservation organizations that exist. I'm not a big joiner, but a fellow traveler. Uh, Travis Audubon, combined with Bastrop Audubon, 
and Bear Audubon out of San Antonio have worked with me all of these years. And in year-around bird counts when this began, we had less than 50 species of birds. That went on. But every year, we started to pick it up after we did habitat restoration. The second thing that wasn't there was a drop of water. You gotta have water. I contacted a driller who drilled seven wells for me. That cost money. 500 foot deep, but he never got a drop of water. Well, I called some buddies of mine to come up for a deer hunt. They liked the rough and tumble of it, and they gave me $3,000 for the deer lease. A year later, I'm needing the money to continue to call them. They didn't show up, you know. Usually the testosterone is going about this time of year, and they're all getting ready for the hunt, you know. And no, I didn't hear from anybody. And I called them and said, Damburger, we don't want your deer lease. The biggest deer we got up there, we took him home in an HEB grocery bag. <laughs> So there was, I couldn't even sell my deer lease for $3,000. Now, I'm getting into the stuff that's really great. You see the grass. The grass on these hills, and you can drive, you can drive the freeways or the county roads just 10 minutes out of Austin, Texas. And you can see what looks like on all the hillsides, a series of steps and risers. Uh, at first I thought that was the oceans uh, going up and down, that's not it. it. It's the laying down of material that uh, as the earth has changed. Now, I'm not a geologist, but I, I want to give some testimony that even the geology I want to talk about in a moment is absolutely true of the hill country, but it's not necessarily true if you went east of Austin or so on. So what I'm talking about and what I'm going to demonstrate to you has to do with the hill country. On the step, there's very little soil. Generally speaking, none. Just a piece of limestone. And as you go up to the, to the uh, riser, you can see the buildup of soil. My testimony to you is Mother Nature's going to put something on the land, even in the Sahara, if, if you abuse the land. After we did this habitat restoration, and this is an aerial picture to give you an idea, the light colored lines are the steps, and the dark colored lines are soil on the riser. Two and a half years after we did this clearing, and you can see many, many, many uh, trees on there, and I'm going to make an estimate that 40, 30 percent of them are, are cedar trees. So we don't believe in removing all of those, but I do believe in grass. And I said that this this presentation has to do with water. Uh, two and a half years after we began, the sides of those hills looked like this. Now, if you look close, you can see the step and you can see the riser. The riser is where the grasses are a little bit taller and the step, you can't see the grass. It's a little bunchy thing, a little seat muley or something, but it does cover it. And if you went out in the, the hill country and looked around and got to walk on someone's property that didn't have good grass cover, you would see those, those steps dripping after a rain sometime for two or three days, water oozing out. So <clears throat> one of the things that made this <laughs> interesting to me was the other side, I'm standing there, the other side of the fence, it's a little bit clear because that's where I turned my bulldozer around, but on my left side, I'll show you a picture in a moment, there was a gully 15 foot deep. I'm going to say 20, 30 foot wide. Three automobile bodies were in that gully. We run the bulldozer in there and smashed them down. And today, you grow some wonderful grass. Why? Look at that fence. That fence is 54 inches tall. Look at it today. It's only 36 or 38. Why? Because what little soil my neighbor had, because he had no grass every time it rained, it bought me another cup full. And it filled that 
gully with three automobile bodies complete and buried them under approximately eight foot of soil. That's the way it looks today. There's my fence looking at it from his side. He caught Joanna and I photographing this and yelled at us, get off my land. We did. He didn't have too much more land. He'd given most of it to us. <laughs> There's the gully with three automobile bodies buried deeply under it. And I didn't put any dirt on top. Mother Nature put it there. Mother Nature put it there because the greatest conservation tool there is, it beats a dam, it beats berms, it beats straightening of creeks, it beats everything, everything that our government wants us to do on waterways, whether it's the Mississippi River or whether it's New Orleans. And grass grows there. It's one of the best grass little areas I have. Now then, here gets the good part. It was two and a half years, and we began to see green spots up on the top of these hills, or a hundred, frankly, it was 125 foot off the top of the hills. We went to inspect it, couldn't figure out, what is that green? This was July and August. We went up there, no roads to it or anything, and climbed up, and here's what we discovered, this little grotto, look at the moss. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab something here to give you an idea of why. The top 125 foot of the hill country, as you go out of Boston and see it, is Edwards Limestone. It's got this stone is full of holes. When my water well driller drilled on top of those hills, one, one hill, he said, David, he said, my bit dropped 40 foot. I had to put another drill stem on to go through. 40 foot, that meant there was an auditorium underground, a cave. No exit to it that we ever found, but it was there. Plus all of the other 125 foot, over 5,500 acres. Boy, all those holes, they hold a lot of water. This sponge represents that 125 foot of the hill country. That 125 foot, a lot of it has that auditorium under it, but every bit of it has all of those holes. With grass on the ground, two and a half years. Now, down comes the rain. I do want to add one other thing. I got a six inch rain, five and a half, six inch rain, that the soil conservation people said, you get it? And you're gonna lose all that wonderful soil you found. Well, I got news for you, we didn't lose it. As you saw, the grass came up because those little ridges where we scarified it when the rains came, there was places that it broke through 30 foot. There was places that broke through six foot wide and only went two foot. But for the most part, you could fly over those pictures and you could look like a grain drill had reseeded the hill country. Now I'm gonna show you why. Now remember, this sponge, it represents the 125 foot of limestone that's on the top of every hill west of here. And so it starts to rain. It starts to rain, it rains again, it rains some more. Oh my, it just rains and rains. We don't have any water, we're buying water. When rainfall falls on the earth, whether it's your lawn or a ranch or a farm, eventually it's gonna run off. That sponge represents, that sponge represents an aquifer. It doesn't matter. In our particular case, it's called a perched or local aquifer. It's only 125 foot deep. Remember we drilled seven wells and we didn't get any water? You know where it is right today? It's in that aquifer. You get the picture, don't you? There it is. You like that, Julia? <laughs> Julia. Julia is one of our best volunteers. Now why is that? 
This is so simple and so cheap. I'm going to tell you I did vote for Proposition 6, but I'm not happy with it. I only voted for it because we weren't going to get anything else. We're going to waste a couple billion dollars, and we're going to build reservoirs and pipelines and everything else. We're leaving out the most important thing there is. When I cleared that brush, there's what brush and woody species have in the ground. But if you're on a prairie, in one square yard of a prairie, there are nine miles of little roots. And therefore, when it rains, it hits the grass, and this grass allows it to not run off, but to run in, and it ran into my sponge, it ran into our aquifer and refilled it. And I'm going to show you some of it, but 11 different places. That little stick of plastic I got there, at 11 different places around the ranch, all at 125 foot from the top, we had a spring. We dug them out, and we cased them off with concrete. And today, we have from three to 6,000 visitors a year come to the ranch. We've got five families that live there with all the automatic stuff and toilets and showers and such, and we don't have a single water well. Not only that, folks, we don't have a pressure pump or a motor. All of the water comes from that sponge, from that perched aquifer that's 125 feet off the top of the hills, and all of our houses are 400 foot off the top. So it's all coming out of those little enclosures. There's one of those enclosures right there. Just nothing but a concrete, which we dug out and cleaned out, and we put the concrete around it so that it wouldn't cave in, and we piped, piped that water out. Here's one you'll love. This cost absolutely nothing. We found this seepy area at 125 foot in another canyon. We took hammers and chisels and we chiseled across, about 10 foot across, and made a little C under the rock. We put a piece of PVC plastic, which we drilled hundreds of holes in, slipped it into there, mortared it over, came back the next day, and out the other end, we were getting a gallon of water a minute. A gallon of water a minute, there's not one of you in your homes, I don't care how many children you get, you don't use that much water in a day. That's over 1,300 gallons. Just a little lousy gallon a minute. Okay, so we did that 11 times, but that, that's just nothing more than an old flu pipe that came off of a chimney. The secret to this is this, is storage. They tell you about that if you have rainwater collection. Well, we've got over 40,000 gallons in storage because all of these springs that are uh, distributed all around, along with the help of solar power, Stephen and Michael uh, that help us have hooked them all up. There's two of them. Each one of those are 55,000, 5,500 gallon each. And those, once again, they are, they're slightly below the 125-foot level. And when all of those tanks are full and we're not flushing toilets and we're using a lot of water, the surplus goes into one of our earthen ponds for fish, for wild fowl, and other wildlife. The secret to all of this is grass. No question about it, grass. This was a slide that was given to me by the Soil Conservation Service that showed you the difference in water. It's hard to believe, but you can get in a cedar break, and in a one-inch rain, you're going to get wet. Only 24% of a one-inch rainfall ever touches the earth. And the rest has transpired out. Well, look at the difference you got in oaks a little better, but look at grass. You put almost 82% of a one inch rain back into your sponge. There you are. And let me tell you, it's crystal clean water too. Now here's the picture. The grass I showed you, and it's a cliche that we use for ranching. And it is take half and leave half. If you put your cattle or your sheep or goats or anything into a pasture and, 
and the pasture looks like the left side, you, don't, you want to get them out of there when you have only taken half of the grass because you need that root system. You need that nine mile we talked about. Incidentally, I want to clear it. That's not true in the hill country with our shallow soils. I don't know what it is. I'd hate to be the, the graduate student whose professor made him add all of that up by digging it up and spreading it out. It'd probably take a month. But anyway, this is true right here in town. Raise the Raise your lawnmower, you'll save yourself water, you'll save yourself fertilizer, you'll save yourself pests, pests getting in there and eating it, and so on. This is big Steve Fulton, he's our biologist, and this is our rain machine, and I'm not sure if I'm going to show it to you good enough here, but we have this demonstration, and uh, the grass is on the left tray. Oh, there we go, it shows it pretty good. The interesting thing also, where you don't have grass cover, in that tray on the right, which is cedar, that soil is 18 degrees warmer, hotter in the summer, frying many of the microorganisms that are in there. Our bird counts that I told you we had with the help of Travis and Bastrop in San Antonio, that started less than 50, now 419. Why? Because a bird's got to have something for net besides nesting material. He's got to have something to drink. He's got to have something to eat. So on the left there with grass, you've got a little uh, uh, insect eater can scratch around and peck around. And when the grass grows up with the seed, the seed eater gets some something, and both of them have water to drink. And so do we. 30 seconds after we start our rain machine, which has four gallon of water in the top and two trays with hypodermic needles, 30 seconds, the runoff on the cedar side shows up and you can see the dark brown water. Why is it dark brown? Because it's taken away that soil. You know how long it takes Mother Nature to, to build an inch of soil? You never guess, it's 500 years. That's why I'm preaching the gospel of grass, folks. My goodness. Over here on the grass side, we never get any runoff. We did last week, however, because we had two and a half inches of rain and had this thing soaked. And when we tried to demonstrate it, it was so soaked it kept on coming. But seven and a half minutes after we start that, we start to get fresh, clean water in the groundwater side. It's a demonstration that children, and we do all the fifth grade schools are what we work with. And I've seen child after child standing up and telling his teacher, I can explain it, I can explain it, after seeing this. There's, there's the grass. You're not going to find that grass on the hillsides. You'll find it limited on the tops, but it's a valley grass. That's, that's uh, Indian grass, yellow Indian grass. Uh oh, I'm going to go backwards here. That was my wife, Margaret, who I, I lost to cancer, uh, standing in the grass that they talk about making ethanol out of. It is switchgrass, yeah. So I'm getting too old to remember all this. Here I am in a prairie, a hill country prairie. A hill country prairie, in the most part, is not like that, like you'd see in Iowa or Kansas. It's in between tree and, but it's, it's still a prairie. And it's beautiful. It has color. Hey, you could, you could make a lawn out of that. I got a story on that too, but I don't, they won't give me enough time to tell you. There's a grass. That's bushy blue stem. A hundred percent of the time you see that grass, there's going to be some water within a couple spadefuls of dirt. That's an indicator deluxe. That's Margaret again. We do workshops on grasses. It's people that bought land and want to know, learn more about it. There's a grass trail we use for education. That grass in the foreground is big blue stem. That's a candy plant deluxe. If you have cows, they're going to eat that out first. And, uh, but we had 77 native grasses on that grass trail. It was just too many to teach. So we're only really teaching 17 of them right now. Now water. Remember, 
43, it's almost 44 years ago, not a drop. Seven water wells cost just almost as much to drill a dry hole as it does a one that produces. Not a drop of water. But then, grass. And then with grass, and look at that. That's only one of 23 stock tanks, or in this case, lake. We call it Madrone Lake because there are 48 Madrone trees around it. Eight that I've propagated and planted, then the other 41 that were Mother Nature, I discovered when we pushed the cedar out. There's another one. There's a creek. Seven years, two creeks began to run. Two creeks began to run after seven years of this. Now, confession, both of those creeks dried up in 211, both of them dried up again in 213. In 211, we lost over 2,000 oak trees from the drought. I have planted personally, done it myself, 408 big tooth maples. <laughs> it's awesome, it'll blow your mind to see. <laughs> I mean, it's so good that we're having a maple spectacular next Saturday. <laughs> and. Uh, Taken, we told them, we, we set out a little bulletin and said, stop, don't go to Vermont or Massachusetts or Connecticut, come to Bamberger and see the maples, you know. Uh, but we only lost two maples and we lost 2,000 oaks. I was very happy to hear that. So if we don't have rain, folks, we don't have water. And our capacity to hold water is in my sponge. If we empty that sponge, and here's how it gets emptied. You buy 10 acres, you buy five acres, you buy 50 or 100, and everybody goes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they start drilling into our aquifer. And it's like putting straws in a Dixie cup from Dairy Queen. Boy, you get the double thick chocolate milkshake for one of you and you're doing fine. If somebody else sticks the straw in there and another one, another one, that don't last very long. And that's, that's why people, the developers, don't care. They don't care for our little sponge, our perched aquifer. It's not even on the charts, but it's geology, folks. And the reason the water comes out at 125 foot, it hits something as solid as that where your feet are right now. And that's true anywhere in the world. You go through all this geology, sometimes the formations are real low, maybe a thousand foot down. In our particular case, it's 125 foot down that it hits the first one, it's called the ma walnut marl. And Water doesn't go through it quite as fast. And that's where our little grass and our aquifer, that's what it does for us. You can do it too. Water, 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 water. Oh, I like this one. These are, these are cypress trees. And we've planted over, we're, we're getting close to 5,000 trees we planted now. But I had some help. My help was a guy that worked for your Austin uh, Parks Department. He was in charge of trees. He was an urban forester. He came out to see me one Saturday. He said, Dave, today we're going to plant 5,000 trees. I said, Jim, what are you smoking, boy? <laughs> he said, I waited in the park, Brackenridge Park in San Antonio. He said, it's like a, the, the creek that goes through the park's like a tunnel, a railroad tunnel. Because each side of it, you see it on the Texas River as you go through the hill country, there's these bald cypress on both sides. And he said, over, this, over the years, the seeds have fallen off into the creek, and they got eddied up on the stone or rock or along the side. He said, this black, stinking muck, he had two five-gallon buckets, is just full. I just know it's full of seed. And he and I took it down and stood alongside this lake and we kept digging the handfuls of that stinking stuff and throwing it out on the water. When it hit the water, it released the seeds again. And with the wind blowing and the cows coming over, 
154 bald cypress come up. He was a little, little wrong on selling, putting 5,000 out, but that was a pretty big home run. And they're beautiful today. Okay, here we go again. Now, here is the big one. This, I got to tell you about because your lower Colorado River Authority board of directors got a hold of me and came out to look at this. You have a governing agency called the Texas Water Development Board. They got a hold and that board of directors came out just to witness what I'm showing you here. This requires no machinery, it's worthless. This only requires the help of people like you. And I read a book, and I told you how books affected my life. This book, the title of it, When the Rivers Run Dry, by Fred Pierce. This is not a newcomer. He spent 20 years researching this book all around the world. First chapter is about Texas. I came out of reading that book in 207. I'm energized. I said, this, this is great. And I wrote a plan called a plan for the future for the staff that I have that helps me. And it calls for the construction of 28 miles of these stone berms on the hillsides. And furthermore, 12 mile of water pans, I call them. The pans go on the top of the hills, the berms on the side. 100% of the stone are picked up from in between where you see in these berms. There's the water pans. Because I didn't, I'm not an engineer, because it, this, this cost, this is the only place we use machinery. We use that old bulldozer. But we had to put the stone berm across each water pan because it was on a downhill, otherwise we'd have had erosion. A two and a half rain, there's one of them in the water pan, the first time it happened. Now down below, at 125 foot, Bonnie, am I in trouble? No, we have about 14 minutes. Oh, gosh sakes, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> at 125 foot level, we constructed this little pond, you might call it. At 125 foot, Look at the water coming out. No pressure tank. We drove, we drove a pipe with an eight pound sledgehammer eight or 10 foot back into the side of the hill. And the water that was held back by those berms which slowed down the runoff of water, giving grasses a chance to hold. And there's grass in there, there wasn't in the beginning. And that water went into our sponge. And so that's what we have. And I keep, we keep jugs there. We keep a stopwatch. And we measure how much. We've got an extra quart of water a minute at 48 hours after a rain. But that's down where it's going to come out anyway. Then below that, any, any we don't take goes into there. And the reason for the fence is your school principals won't let us have the kids play here because they might get hurt. So we had to build that for them. What a tragedy. The kids had more fun getting stuff out of there. This is Leroy Petrie, who's been with me the entire time. And I'm up here bragging about what I've done. <laughs> let me tell you something. Nobody does it alone. I don't care if it's a successful business or a successful marriage. You don't do it alone. This is uh, my greeting. I like to tell this story. I greet everybody that comes to the ranch. And everybody, I think, has a period in their life where you perhaps look back, ask yourself the question, what have I, what have I done? What have I accomplished? What good has my life been to anybody or anything? And, not to think that what you've done isn't worthwhile, but perhaps you want to change directions. And that happened to me about 50 years ago when I decided I wanted to do something for Mother Nature and I got into the environmental work. 
Then the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1972, and I saw the paranoia of the private landowners in this part of Texas when the golden cheek warbler was listed as a federally listed endangered species. And a lot of the private landowners, a lot of them were just gone berserk. They put the bulldozers to work and everything, got get, get, get rid of all this cedar because the government's going to take our land this bigger than anything, and blah, blah, blah. But I got to also answer, I saw the paranoia in the biologists too. Oh, they said, you can't take down a cedar tree. My gosh, it's the golden cheek warbler, he has to have that for his nesting material. I'm going to give you the Bamberger Smart Alec testimony. I had enough cedar to take care of every golden cheek warbler on the planet Earth. <laughs> we could afford to get rid of some of it. Sorry about that, Julie. <laughs> the, uh, the, the little bird only uses the bark to make a nest. And he's got to have something to drink and something to eat. And that's what makes this thing holistic. But when I encountered that, that's when I created the historical marker, which says, in memory of man, that's us, he who dominated the earth, that's us, destroyed it. We destroyed it with our own poisons. That's what you're putting out to kill everything. Yeah. Our waste, landfills, unbelievable. And then, of course, our own numbers. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. All my life I wanted a greenhouse. Uh, never could afford it at the beginning. But we planted trees and we planted uh, from seed. We raised them from seed. This one happened to be in a grow bag. That was a bur oak in a grow bag. That's a 90-pound tree that's going out to be planted. So it's, it's halfway grown when we get it there. This is one of our maple trees I'm so proud of. These are a group of Boy Scouts with whom we've worked many, many, many. We probably qualified over 100 boys for their merit badge in conservation. This is me giving them my thing about trees at our workshop. I look pretty old in there, so that must have been last year. <laughs> and we can tell you something else. You see those corrals around the trees? You don't do that when you plant a, hill, a tree in the hill country. You're not going to ever get a tree. Because the goat and the deer, pocket deer primarily, they're going to snip every single one off. You better let the tree get pretty big before you do it. Here's some kids from one of your schools here in Austin working in one of our creeks, measuring the uh, quality of the water. There are some kids from the University of Minnesota, believe it or not. They came out. This, this is a five-year program, and their children came down here for the monarch butterflies in October, and our kids went up there in the spring for monarch butterflies going that way. We have a facility there that will sleep 48 that we use. And with, the, with your inner city schools, your Title I schools that we work with, they come for three days and two nights. And I'm really proud to tell you that it don't cost the school a nickel. We give the children seven meals. Don't cost the parents a nickel. The parents don't have it. Don't cost the taxpayers a, pen, a, a nickel. We do all of this for free, but we do work hard with some of the to the, some of the organizations that make grants for such things. But we've never been successful in securing total funding for all of these things. We believe it's I believe it's essential, and uh, I tell. Colleen and all the help there that no child has ever beat a refused admission to this just because they don't have seven dollars. And, and they don't. We have three outdoor classrooms along these trails. This was a, our bird feeder. It was a five acre bird feeder. Nothing could in, get, could get in there except birds. I put some ramps up over there when I first built it. 
because I noticed the turkeys wanted to get in. They run them ramps up and down. Well, we'd put a lot of chili patines in there. When I got our Thanksgiving, whoops, when I got our Thanksgiving turkey, that meat would taste like a jalapeno pepper. <laughs> Another nice thing that we discovered there, believe it or not, up on the tops of the hills, was these dinosaur tracks. Scientists that work with this kind of thing have said it's some of the best they've ever found in Edwards limestone. You can even see the toenails. This was kind of wild, and I came under a lot of flack, but I built a cave because I was interested in bats. And uh, this shows you the cave prior to it being shot with gunite, like you'd do a swimming pool. And the sheer size of it is indicated by Jim up there on the top. It had a big entrance, it has an observation room where you can watch, it's inoperative, and three major domes. And this past summer, we only had 200,000 bats in there. I got a kick out of it when, uh, when the reporter from the San Antonio Express News called this, this was about 12 years ago. He said, uh, I'm doing a follow-up on that story, Bamberger. How many bats you got? I said, well, Zeke, I, I didn't have any. I had a dozen. I said, Zeke, I can't tell you how many bats are in there, but I can tell you this. It cost me $5,000 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I am going to say this in your church. God has looked out for me that reporter puts an article in the San Antonio Express News and the title of it is Bamberger's Folly. This guy spent more money building a house for bats than he did on his own home and he don't have any. Well, just before he got that in print, 20,000 bats found that migrating down from Kansas or Indiana. And I called Tom Coons, Dr. Coons from Boston University. He's been helping me on this for years. I said, Tom, I had, I had at least 20,000 bats left. He said, David, that's a nice story, but they're just on their way home. They don't, that don't happen that way. They won't come back. But I called Steve Brown at the Channel 12 in San Antonio, and I'd done him a lot of favors in previous years. He got a film crew up there. Hey, this guy's piece comes out in the Sunday Express News, Monday 5 o'clock news, and 10 o'clock news. Steve Brown is showing all those bats pouring out of that cave. And I get a phone call from Zeke McCormick. Bamberger, you mousetrap me. You mousetrap me. My editor's on me. I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> I said, no, Zeke, you just jumped the gun a little bit. And anyway, it has continued to grow. And these kind of things that I'm talking about that we have done, there's the bats. They, incidentally, if you didn't know it, they can congregate at the rate of 5,000. No, 500, yes, I'm sorry, per square foot. The babies at 300. But they have developed right there on Seal of Bamberger Ranch at great expense with the help of the National Science Foundation, an algorithm system connected to uh, infrared computerized cameras. And Tom told me each camera cost $55,000. Anyway, over a period of five years, they developed a way of counting the bats as they came out. And 24 hours after those students and all those PhDs were there, they called me the next day and said, Mr. Bamberger, last night you had 126,503 or whatever. Just fantastic. Uh, okay, whoops, whoops, whoops. This is, uh, I told you when I began, my influence of my mother and Lewis Bromfield's book, two moving factors in my life, mother being the biggest. And I built, her name was Hester, and I built this building. It's a, completely like a little old store in Welfare, Texas, which is up around Comfort somewhere. And I put everything that I've inherited from my mother in there except one. Couldn't put that there. 
It's a passion for Mother Nature. But when she heard I was doing this, she said, uh, why are, I told her I was going to build a log cabin. She said, oh, David, I, I love log cabins. Oh, there's so many in Ohio. Why are you doing it? I said, Mom, I don't know. But something's happened to me, and I just feel that this ranch is going to mean more to others into the future than it does even to me. So maybe it'll be a gathering place. Maybe it'll be a little museum. She said, would, would you want any of my things? Now, she lived in a 1,000-acre, very humble, board and bad house. She wouldn't accept anything from anybody. She lived amongst, we grew up amongst the Amish people in Ohio. And then she looked at me and she said, David, with all you have, I'm never going to be a burden on you. I said, Mom, don't talk that way. You're never going to be a burden on me. She said, no, and I'll tell you something else, son. Nobody's ever going to put me in one of those warehouses. Yeah, some of us with gray hair know what she meant. The old daycare center, or whatever you want to call it. She said, no, David, when my time comes, she said, remember I used to call you Johnny Appleseed? Two of the trees, she said, you didn't work. You just stood there and jabbered. But she said, two of those apple trees that we planted still produce a few apples. And when my time comes, if you can't find me, I want you to look in my trees. Six months later, I had a phone call from Ohio. I said, you need to come up here, David. Your mother died. No light on, called, went over, took a flashlight, went down that little trail to her trees. We found her there under a tree with a wildflower bouquet in the left hand and a prayer of pruning shears in the other. And she sat down under that tree and passed away, just like she did. Thank you for such an inspiring presentation. And I hope we'll all become conservationists.